Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I just have to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subs and to thank everybody who's been leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And if you would like to take a couple extra steps to help support the channel a little bit more, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you all so much for all your support. Oh, and guys, we got some brand new t-shirts and merch designs on my merch store, so feel free to go and check that out. All right, guys. Well, hey, I did plan to do a video on the RMS Titanic today, but you guys really want Lusitania Episode 3. So, you guys want it, so that's what you're going to get. All right, guys. Well, hey, it is now time to continue the story of the world-famous RMS Lusitania. Let's try to shed light on what happened to this very famous vessel lost to history. When we last left the RMS Lusitania, the Cunard Line had just begun construction on this brand new revolutionary ocean liner. However, even though the Cunard Line was working on the ship, they were only focusing on building the bow part of the ship and not the stern. This was because an important design decision had yet to be reached. The Cunard Line did not know what kind of engine the brand new Lusitania and its sister ship RMS Mauritania would use. They were trying to decide between the traditional reciprocating engine or the brand new steam-powered turbine, which, although the turbine had been successful in early tests, the engine had not yet been used in a big ship like the Lusitania. So the Cunard Line wasn't very comfortable with using it on the new ship yet. However, the Cunard Line did have a way to test the engine to see if it would prove successful in the brand new Lusitania and Mauritania. At the exact same time that the Lusitania and Mauritania were under construction, the Cunard Line also had two other smaller ocean liners currently being built. So the Cunard Line decided to use both of these ships to perform an experiment to ultimately decide if the turbine engine was worth using instead of the traditional reciprocating engine. You see, these two ships were the Coronia and the Carmania. And what the Cunard Line was going to do was they were going to put the traditional reciprocating engine in one ship and then they were going to put the steam-powered turbine in another ship. And then they were going to basically put these two ships into a competition with each other and see which one won. And then based on this little competition or experiment or whatever you want to call it, they would ultimately decide if the steam-powered turbine was worth using in the new Lusitania and Mauritania. The Cunard Line decided to run this experiment with these two ships in January of 1905. What they did was they decided to have the Coronia have the traditional reciprocating engine since that ship would be completed first. In fact, the Coronia would be ready to go just one month later in February of 1905. However, its sister ship Carmania wouldn't be done until December of 1905. So, because this ship wasn't as far along in the construction process, it made this vessel the perfect candidate to receive the brand new steam-powered turbine. Although, even though the Cunard Line did have this plan in place, that did mean that they would have to wait nearly a year before they would ultimately decide if the steam-powered turbine was going to be used in the Lusitania and Mauritania. Now, even though the Cunard Line did have to wait roughly a year before they could ultimately decide what type of engine to use in the Lusitania and Mauritania, they did not stop construction on these two ships during that time frame. Basically, what they did was they just had the construction teams work around the back part of the ship where the engines would go, and, you know, they just tried to carry on as best they could. But the work definitely proceeded more slowly with the Lusitania and Mauritania throughout 1905, while they waited to find out what type of engine both of these ships would utilize. Then, in December of 1905, the RMS Carmania was finally completed and ready to be put to sea. Once this vessel entered service, the Cunard Line wasted no time in testing the Carmania against its sister ship Coronia to see which ship would outperform the other. And, as expected, the Carmania outperformed the Coronia with its brand new steam turbine engine. So, with this experiment completed, the Cunard Line finally knew that the steam turbine engine would work in their new ships. So, they decided to put the steam turbine engine in the Lusitania and Mauritania, and construction could finally resume on these vessels at full speed. Once the Cunard Line decided on what engine both of these ships would use, it didn't take very long for the shipyard to finish work on the Lusitania and Mauritania's hull. The Lusitania was launched on June 7, 1906, and its sister ship Mauritania was only a few months behind. The Mauritania's hull was launched in September of 1906. So, with both of these vessels now in the water, work could begin on finishing out their interiors, getting all the funnels attached, and basically doing everything they needed to in order to turn the hull of both of these vessels into the beautiful transatlantic ocean liners that they were always destined to be. 
All right, so with everything that the Canard Line has had to go through so far with the building of the Lusitania, surely now that the vessel is in the water and now that they decide on what type of engine the ship is going to use, they passed all the really difficult stuff with the Lusitania. It's going to be nothing but smooth sailing for the rest of the Lusitania and Mauritania's construction process, right? Well, you would be right and you would be wrong at the exact same time. In terms of finishing up building the Lusitania, work would proceed rather smoothly. Although, when they finally got to the time period at which it was time to begin the Lusitania Sea Trials, well, they would discover another major problem with the vessel that would have to be addressed before the Lusitania could head out on its maiden voyage. Work on the Lusitania was completed in the summer of 1907. However, before this vessel went to undergo her official sea trials, the people at Canard Line wanted the ship to go through a preliminary sea trial just to get a feel for what the vessel was capable of. This was because where the ship had the brand new turbine engine, they wanted to see what the ship could do before she was officially judged and deemed whether or not she was seaworthy enough to take on passengers. Now, the Canard Line decided to have this preliminary trial, or otherwise known as a builder's trial at the time, on July 27, 1907. And they invited people from the British Board of Trade, from the Admiralty, members of the Canard Line staff, people from the shipyard. They invited all these people to come out and see how the Lusitania would perform on her first time out at sea. And for the most part, these preliminary trials went okay. The big highlight for the trial was when they accelerated the Lusitania to maximum speed. The vessel reached speeds of somewhere around 25 to 25 and a half knots, which exceeded the British Admiralty's requirements for the speed requirements of the Lusitania. So this part of the trial was a big success. However, there was one big problem. When the Lusitania was operating at maximum speed, the vibrations generated by the steam turbine engines were so severe in the aft end sections of the ship, or at least in parts of the aft end section, that it made those spaces on the ship nearly uninhabitable. Basically what this means was if you were in one of those back rooms of the ship when they accelerated the Lusitania up to full speed, you would be shaking like crazy as the Lusitania's engines were running. So as you can imagine, the people at Canard Line weren't happy about this and work would have to be done on these sections of the ship before the Lusitania could, pr could proceed on her maiden voyage. However, the Canard Line noticed that the vibration issues with the Lusitania were the worst when the ship was running at maximum speed. If they decreased the speed a bit while the vibrations weren't completely gone, they were more manageable. So, after the builder's trial was complete, before any work was done with the Lusitania, they were comfortable enough to invite a few VIP guests on board to have a bit of a shakedown cruise, so to speak. These VIP guests spent a couple of days on board the ship, and the Canard Line wanted to see what they thought of the Lusitania. They also took this time to test the Lusitania under various speeds. However, they never got the ship up to her maximum speed to minimize the vibration issue. And this shakedown cruise went well, and the VIP guests departed the vessel on July 29th, 1907. And then right after they left, the official sea trials for the Lusitania began. The Lusitania's official sea trials took place over a three-day period. Now, one of the first things the Canard Line did with members of the Board of Trade who came to check out the vessel was inform them about the vibration issue with the ship. The Board of Trade basically told them what you can expect. You know, they needed to get that looked at before the Lusitania could head out on its maiden voyage. But besides the vibration issue, the sea trials for the Lusitania went perfectly. The ship was highly maneuverable, and believe it or not, when they did a full speed test with the Lusitania, they were able to get it to somewhere around 26 to 26 and a half knots, which was incredible for the time. They even did a full-on stop test, which means they had the Lusitania travel at near full speed or at full speed, and then they told the engines to run at full stern to try to stop the ship as fast as they could, and believe it or not, they were able to stop the ship in somewhere around four minutes, which was incredible. The Lusitania was also highly maneuverable, and honestly, she passed the test with flying collars, minus the whole vibration issue. So, once the Board of Trade said, yep, the Lusitania is good, just get the vibration issue solved, Canard Line took the Lusitania and had the ship head back to the shipyard, where they would try to get the vibration issue addressed. And then, after that, the Lusitania was free to head out on its maiden voyage. When the Lusitania returned to the shipyard, what the Canard Line did in order to try to minimize the vibrations of the vessel was to add more steel beams and arches to the back end section of the Lusitania. However, in order to do this, they had to take apart entire second class spaces on board the ship and then rebuild them. 
Now they were successful in adding these steel beams and arches, and it did help with the vibrations some, however they did not completely go away. And the whole process of trying to minimize the Lusitania's vibrations and deal with it was something that the Canard line would continue to work on throughout the rest of the Lusitania's career. So, once the shipyard was finished working on the RMS Lusitania's stern section, the Canard line was more than ready to finally take possession of the Lusitania and have it travel on its maiden voyage. The Canard line planned to have the Lusitania's maiden voyage occur on September 7, 1907. The ship was going to travel from Liverpool all the way to New York City. And the Canard Line hoped that when the Lusitania finally headed out to sea with passengers for the first time, this would signal in the beginning of a new era. An era at which Canard Line would finally be known as the world's greatest steamship company. But we can talk more about that in the next episode. I think this is a good place to pause the Lusitania Timeline series for now. So thank you all so much for watching. Be sure you leave a like, be sure to subscribe, and guys, be sure you go and check out my merch store if you would like to pick up one of these really cool new historic travel t-shirts or some of the other merch that I have on there. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a good day, everybody. Special thanks to our captain-level Patreon supporters, Dakota Charbonneau, Moosh, and Greg Gallick. Thank you all so much for all the support.